but we can go ahead and uh, get started uh, with a little bit of the uh, lecture that, that would go before the interactive session uh, of this course. All right, so a uh, little bit first about what RNA-seq data actually provides. So uh, it allows us to do quite a few things. We can obviously uh, use it to annotate uh, assembled genomes, or we can just do uh, assemblies of uh, whole transcriptomes. Um, we can also use it uh, to look for uh, genomic variants by mapping that uh, those reads, the RNA-seq reads back to the genome or to an assembled transcriptome uh, to look for, for differences uh, there. There are programs that allow us to do uh, scaffolding of genome assemblies. So whenever we do uh, especially short read uh, genome assemblies, those are often uh, highly fragmented. Uh, and if we have RNA-seq data uh, that uh, you know may span uh, gaps within the assembly, we can use that to stitch together uh, those uh, different contigs to make uh, longer contiguous segments, segments called set scaffolds. And then lastly, uh, what we're going to be doing today is we can use it to measure gene expression and detect differences uh, between, uh, say, an experimental group and a, and a control group, or a disease group and a uh, wild type Uh, so, uh, just a brief overview of some of the different applications uh, that you may be aware of. Uh, for transcriptome assembly, uh, de novo, that's without any reference genome. Uh, we have programs like uh, Trinity, which is probably the, the most popular one, uh, Oasis, and SOAP de novo trans. Uh, and then we have things like uh, reference-based transcriptome assemblies uh, that require a uh, previously assembled genome. Uh, and we can use tools. Again, Trinity can use a, a reference uh, uh, to do its assembly, but we can also use programs like string tie or cufflinks. Uh, if we're going to use a reference genome, uh, we can't use uh, just any uh, sort of a read aligner. Uh, it requires that uh, the alignment software be splice aware. Uh, and so to show that over here on the uh, right, we have a diagram of uh, you know RNA that's been uh, sequenced once it's reached uh, maturity, uh, and you can see these segments in blue. If we take those and map them back to the genome, uh, the aligner is going to have to uh, recognize that these reads uh, that span uh, these introns are going to be cut in half and mapped to different exons. So uh, there are quite a few splice aware aligners that uh, can do this. Uh, HiSat2 is a very popular one as, as well as STAR, those are probably the most two popular. And then uh, we have a GPU accelerated version of STAR that's provided by uh, NVIDIA called Parabricks. Uh, and we're actually having a uh, short course on that um, if access is, is up and running this afternoon. Uh, and then lastly, uh, Top Hat is uh, an older uh, splice aware aligner that um, uh, was used uh, very frequently in the past. Uh, but uh, even the authors are, are urging people to move away from Top Hat and move on to uh, newer aligners. All right, so uh, once we have our alignment, uh, that could be in either a SAM or, or a uh, BAM format, so um, a human readable SAM or a binary BAM alignment file. Uh, we may need to do some uh, conversion and sorting and things like that, uh, maybe marking duplicates, and we can use programs like uh, SAM tools or Picard tools for this. Uh, for variant calling, uh, we could actually use uh, the, the uh, popular GATK software pipeline and run the haplotype caller in RNA-seq mode. And finally, as I mentioned, uh, for scaffolding assemblies, uh, you could use these programs, LRNA Scaffolder or RASCAF. Uh, so one of the things that we need to consider whenever we're doing a, a differential expression study is uh, how we're going to generate these libraries. Uh, 
So we have uh, three basic methods here, uh, poly A selection, uh, which is gonna uh, pull down everything with that uh, polyadenylated uh, tail on the uh, mature mRNA. And that's gonna enrich for mRNA and leave out things like long non-coding RNA and uh, small non-coding RNA. Uh, we have a question in chat. Are most of the programs you're mentioning specific to eukaryotes? Uh, is, is, yeah, some of them would uh, be useful, more useful in eukaryotes. Uh, I've never done differential expression outside of eukaryotes. Uh, or worked with RNA-seq data outside of eukaryotes. So I uh, am not well-versed in uh, software that may be specialized for that. I'm sure there are uh, tools available, um, but the general practice will be the same uh, of, of aligning and then um, doing read counts. And then once we get to uh, to working in R and doing differential expression, uh, then it should all be all be the same. But uh, that's a good good question. I'm not sure if uh, there are uh, non-eukaryote specific RNA seq aligners. Uh, all right, so um, poly A, um, again, it's gonna enrich for uh, mostly mRNA. Uh, You'll get some long non-coding RNA in my experience, but not uh, not a lot. Um, in order to get uh, the uh, kind of the full uh, range of, of different RNAs, you'd want to use something like ribosomal depletion, which just uh, removes that ribosomal RNA, which can really swamp out your libraries. And it leaves behind uh, all of the, the mRNA, the mature mRNA, the long non-coding RNA, and all of the pre-RNA. And then lastly, um, you can use something like size selection uh, to get uh, libraries for small RNAs. So things like uh, microRNAs or pi RNAs uh, and things like that. And uh, the pipelines for that are uh, considerably different. And there are uh, very specific pipelines for, for doing uh, like microRNA expression. Are there any questions uh, over uh, library prep? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask or, or throw the, the questions in chat. Uh, I like uh, these sessions to be as interactive as possible. It makes uh, teaching a lot easier. Yep. I wanted to know that they, they are in uh, all of the cells or no? If what are in all of the cells? Uh, sequencing RNA is in the all of the cells in the body or no, in the special cells. The, well, so you can, uh, you can do um, different things. You can do uh, cell selection, uh, like single cell RNA-seq analysis, and that's gonna pull down from uh, a particular cell or cell type. Uh, which, which cells uh, this will happen? It, it depends on what your what the the question is that you're trying to to ask. Uh, so, um, if you're you know interested in uh, like heart cells or liver cells, uh, you can you know just generate uh, libraries from that, and the expression profile is going to be wildly different between those tissue types, of course. Oh, thank you. All right. Uh, so whenever we're setting up our uh, experimental designs uh, for differential expression, there are a few things that we really need to consider. Uh, one of those is sequencing depth. Um, and according to ENCODE, uh, which was the, the major uh, project uh, that uh, annotated the human genome and others, uh, you need at least a minimum of 30 million aligned reads uh, per replicate or per sample. Uh, and Illumina suggests uh, between 30 and 60 million uh, reads per replicate. Uh, so that's sequencing depth. Um, the other uh, really important thing is replicate number. Uh, so the minimum minimum you want uh, for each condition is going to be three replicates. Uh, and 
Uh, that'll allow you to do the analysis and you'll recover uh, a portion of those, those genes that are, are truly differentially expressed. Um, but studies have shown that using only three replicates uh, might only recover 20 to 40% of those differentially expressed genes. Uh, and so the study by Sturch et al. Uh, suggests at least uh, six replicates per condition minimum and uh, 12 replicates per condition being optimal so that you can remove a lot of the noise um, that comes from things like just uh, stochastic events in, in uh, uh, the library prep or uh, you know, diff small differences in the cellular compositions of your samples. Uh, so uh, this is where your price really starts to go up whenever you're generating these libraries and having to sequence them to you know, considerable depth, uh, but it really does make the, uh, the study a lot, a lot stronger if you can really increase the number of replicates that you're using per condition. And then finally, uh, there are different types of replicates that we can use. Uh, first off, we have uh, biological replicates, and uh, those are going to come uh, from different uh, populations uh, or individuals. So uh, on the right here, it's showing, you know, we have three different mice and we're going to prep a, an RNA-seq library uh, from each of uh, uh, those mice. Uh, technical replicates, uh, you may have to use if, uh, say, you're working with a species that's hard to get or uh, a particular uh, tissue that's difficult uh, to acquire. So, for example, for my dissertation, I was working with uh, big cat hybrids on uh, uh, testes tissue. And so that was, as you can imagine, really difficult to come by. So we would have to use technical replicates and create uh, three separate libraries uh, from the same sample. So which one do you want to use? Uh, the biological replicates are generally gonna be better. Uh, they increase the statistical power more than just those technical replicates. Uh, and that's because that biological variability between samples is, is far greater than the, the technical variability caused by things like library prep. Uh, and then finally, those, those biological replicates contain both that biological variability and the technical variability. Uh, so when possible, use the biological replicates. Uh, so uh, you'll want to make your way to hprc.tamu.edu. Uh, uh, and then you can click on uh, portal and then go to the ACES portal uh, accident. All right, so um, we'll wanna click on uh, clusters and then ACES shell access. And uh, that should pull this uh, screen up. It should allow you to have uh, shell access to the ACES system. And you'll see a lot of information here. Uh, we have uh, essentially all of our contact information uh, website, consulting, uh, where to find documentation for uh, the, the different clusters that we have and our YouTube channel, uh, some important policy information, and uh, then uh, the message of the day, and then finally your quota limits. Now that we are here, uh, we are going to be working today uh, through uh, all of the steps needed for a differential expression analysis. Um, and we're going to be using uh, real world data. Uh, so this was published in Science a few years ago, uh, looking at uh, glaucoma in mice um, and uh, the effects of uh, this uh, vitamin B3 on, on, on treating that. Uh, and so we're going to go through, through the full pipeline today of aligning the data, a subset of the data, uh, doing our conversions with SAM tools and things like that. And then uh, finally, we're going to open up our studio and uh, go through all of the commands for differential expression there. So the first thing we want to do is make a new directory in our scratch space. So we'll do make dir dollar sign scratch, which is an environmental variable uh, that just maps to each user's scratch space. And then we're going to call this RNA underscore class. And then we will change into that working directory with the CD command, CD scratch, RNA underscore class. 
Now, if we do an LS to see the contents, we can see there's nothing there. So we'll need to copy all of the example data into our current working directory. And we can do that with the command CP space uh, dash R uh, slash scratch slash training. And you can hit tab to autocomplete here. Uh, RNA under, or RNA dash seek uh, asterisk. And then it's important to put a space and then a period. And that should copy everything into uh, this directory that we just created. So if we run LS again, we can see now that we've got uh, this uh, control one uh, fastq files for the uh, forward and reverse reads, a directory named counts, and then uh, the GFF file for the mouse, which is uh, the annotation file. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is uh, do a quality control assessment of our RNA-seq libraries. Uh, and so what we need to do is remove things like uh, uh, the adapter and the uh, any low quality bases. Uh, and if we remove those, then that's gonna increase our mapping rate. Uh, one thing we wanna do is uh, avoid any uh, overly aggressive trimming practices. And by that, I mean, uh, whenever you see this, essentially on the right, it's a, a diagram of quality across the read. Uh, and you can see this is a very typical profile where it starts um, with kind of somewhat lower quality. And then towards the middle of the read, we start getting these really high quality uh, base calls and then drops off at the end. Uh, you don't want to try to uh, trim, you know, say like 20 base pairs off either side to just retain that really high quality stuff uh, because that uh, you start to lose the specificity, specificity of each read. And so you're actually going to re greatly reduce your mapping. So we can use a few different programs uh, for uh, looking at RNA uh, C quality or, or DNA uh, quality as well, any Illumina libraries. Uh, the one we're gonna be using is called FastQC, uh, which is a really great program. It, it produces this nice HTML with all of these different quality statistics that we'll go over. Uh, so on the ACES system, in order to uh, find a particular program that we wanna work with, uh, we'll do a module spider and uh, we'll look for the program fast QC. All right. Uh, and so this bring, brings up uh, the information. Uh, if we had more than one version of fast QC, it would bring it up, but uh, ACES is a new system and we only have the latest version installed. And it tells us this module can be loaded directly with this command. All right, so before we load that, we'll do a module purge, which we shouldn't have anything loaded, but it's always good practice to do that. And then I'll just come up here and grab that. And we'll do module load uh, fast QC slash 0.11.9 dash Java dash 11. All right, and so that should be loaded. Uh, so we are running, uh, most or a lot of the commands today we're going to be running on uh, the login nodes. So we should all currently be on an ACES login node. Uh, and uh, that's really for really small jobs. So for things like text editing or like uh, creating your, your job script files, if we're running larger jobs, uh, you'll want to submit those to the compute nodes. Um, everything we're doing today is with uh, data that's been greatly reduced. Uh, so you'll see it takes, you know, under a minute for us to map our reads. Uh, that's because it's not a full data set. Um, so these commands can easily be incorporated into a job script uh, that you can just submit to the, the compute node. And we have templates for these kinds of uh, jobs as well. So uh, it should be easy to uh, move these, these commands that you learned today into a, a simple job script and, and run them on the compute node. Uh, and you can find uh, template job scripts uh, here uh, using this program, GCA Templates. And the link is in the PDF. Uh, so we are going to run uh, FastQC on our example FastQs. Uh, and so this is the command. It's FastQC um, dash T is two. Uh, and that's just telling it to use uh, two threads. Uh, the dash O, we're gonna say, 
is our output and we want to put it all in the current working directory. And uh, then we just feed in our fastq files. Uh, so that's fastqc dash p two space two dash o current working directory control one underscore r one control one underscore r two and uh, let me copy this before I hit enter and paste that in because we'll get a lot of output here. It's pretty verbose. Uh, hit enter. And as you can see, uh, it completed in about three seconds. So uh, again, these data sets are really small. Um, so even for things like trimming, uh, you likely want to do that on the compute node. Now we're going to go um, to our uh, we'll go back to the uh, ACES portal. And then uh, we'll go to files and then scratch. Uh, and then I'm going to go into RNA underscore class. Uh, and you can see uh, we've got uh, these two zip files that we generated, and then also these HTML files. Uh, unfortunately, you can't view these here. That's just going to pull up the actual HTML script. Uh, so we'll have to uh, uh, download them. Uh, and then open them up uh, to view here. All right, so I actually have all of these in the uh, slides. So, so uh, let's. Uh, I've got. Uh, I pulled all these images from the HTML file earlier, uh, so uh, we can just work through uh, the slides here. Uh, let's first talk about the the FastQ format. Uh, so essentially, every read in the FastQ format has four lines. We've got. Uh, the read name, which starts with the at symbol, uh, and then uh, we'll provide uh, essentially the read name. Here it's ERR 504-787.2.1, uh, and then a bunch of other information uh, where it was on the flow cell, the length of the read. In the second line, we have the actual uh, base calls themselves, uh, so ranging from 1 to uh, 100. Uh, the third line can either be just a plus symbol or a plus symbol followed by the read name again. And then under that, we have our uh, uh, quality scores for each of the base calls. Uh, and so each of those symbols is going to mean a different thread based quality score, uh, which FastQC uh, will take and uh, convert into a box plot, which is what you see uh, below. Uh, so you can see, uh, again, uh, e, uh, all of these are RNA-seq reads. So they may not all be mRNA, um, but they're all, it's from the RNA-seq library, all of these base call sequences. Uh, so uh, the way this works is, is we have each uh, position along the read uh, up through the first uh, nine or 10 bases. Uh, and then it starts binning um, in pairs uh, and, and show you a box plot of the quality scores. So we have uh, essentially the upper extreme of the scores. And you can see, uh, especially here, you know, 18 through uh, uh, 66 or so, it's uh, the median um, and upper quartile, all that is, is really hugging the top of that, uh, the graph. Um, and then, of course, our lower quartile and uh, lower extreme, and that really starts to, to drop off towards the end of the read. Uh, so we're just going to go through um, the, uh, in the HTML file, uh, we can see it's this nice uh, report. All of these are, are passing. Uh, we do have some overrepresented uh, sequences. Uh, that's the one thing that failed. We have this big, bright red X. 
uh, and that's showing us that these are uh, uh, Illumina adapters that are in a sequence. Uh, so we're going to have to trim uh, out these adapter sequences uh, when we move on. But everything else uh, looks really good. The distribution, uh, the per base sequence content's fine. Uh, the this is a uh, this is showing the the quality of the uh, the flow cell so the tile. Uh, per tile sequence quality. This all looks good in, in all blue. We're uh, going to go over, though, now uh, what some uh, failed uh, QC uh, looks like. Uh, and these are some extreme examples. Um, uh, but it's good to kind of uh, see um, what you m hopefully won't run into. Uh, but um, if you see something you know this bad, then uh, you may have some serious issues with your RNAseq libraries. So the first one uh, was a library produced with a an expired uh, MySeq kit. Uh, so uh, likely the reagents and, and, and things, the enzymes were were not uh, uh, fully functional and and uh, failed to produce a, a high quality library. Uh, here we have a faulty flow cell. Uh, so the Illumina. Uh, uh, the MySeq flow cell in this case uh, was just bad. And so you see like this huge patch uh, in the uh, the bottom, the way this is arranged is is not great. Uh, so this is actually the top, the lower half, and uh, uh, this is the bottom, but um, there's this huge patch in the middle that's, that's not uh, high quality. So in this case, um, you could send this to Illumina and they'd be like, oh, that's our bad. Here's another flow cell. Um, we'll we'll uh, rerun it. All right, so uh, we had a question on the uh, per sequence GC content, uh, and essentially what you want. Let's pull in our good example here. Uh, is the GC count per read to uh, mimic this uh, theoretical distribution closely? Uh, and that means that that your mean GC content here is around 44%. And so we can take this uh, and make sure that it, it lines up with what we expect uh, from our uh, sample species. So in this case, this aligns closely with the GC content of the mouse genome or transcriptome. Uh, so this looks really good. Uh, it's going to shift depending on the species. Uh, so, you know, you're going to have different GC content for each species that you're looking at, but you just want these two patterns to, to match uh, and you want them to be uh, unimodal. All right. If you start seeing uh, any sort of like bimodal or multimodal peaks in your GC content, uh, then you have a major issue. Uh, it's likely uh, caused by some sort of, of contamination. All right, and I, this is the one issue that I have run into uh, a large number of times uh, working as a bioinformatician for the, the sequencing facility on campus. Uh, I saw contamination quite a bit in uh, uh, different RNA-seq studies. Um, and so you can see here, uh, the theoretical distribution is uh, thrown off quite a bit. Um, and then we have these different peaks, which are gonna be caused by uh, different, species um, in in your mix. Uh, so uh, you're not gonna get in, from what I've seen, everything that you get in a differential expression, if you continue with this type of data uh, is going to be uh, um, dubious at best. So this is something that you really wanna watch out for. All right, so now we're gonna go into uh, library trimming. Uh, and essentially, uh, well, here's a here's a nice little uh, infographic about it. Um, whenever we have our our uh, double stranded cDNA that we've generated, uh, we'll take our our forward read and the green and reverse read um, from the sequencer, uh, and those are each going to be uh, you know seventy five to three hundred base pairs, whatever you know uh, configuration you did. Uh, and then um, whenever we do our trimming. Uh, what happens frequently is uh, most, if not you know, all of read one 
uh, the forward read is going to pass that QC. Uh, a lot of times towards the end of a run in Illumina, you really start to drop off in quality. And so your uh, reverse reads or are going to end up being trimmed uh, more heavily than your forward reads, uh, which leaves a much uh, shorter read too. Uh, and so you can specify over here a uh, minimum read length of what you want to keep as far as uh, how short you're allowed you're allowing your reads to go. Uh, and the default there in trim galore that we're going to be using today is is 20 base pairs. But you can also specify uh, whether or not you want to uh, return only uh, reads that have uh, both members or both uh, yeah, both members of the pair, uh, or you can also trim uh, and remove, you know, just read two or read one and write those single now single end reads to a separate file. So you have that option with trim galore. The reason I like Trim Galore is that it'll automatically identify your uh, adapter sequences and remove those. Uh, and so you don't have to specify that sequence, which you do um, the last time I ran Trimomatic, you had to do. And then also uh, FastQC uh, and uh, Trim Galore, which is just um, a wraparound script for Cut Adapt, um, which you may have heard of uh, instead of Trim Galore. Trim Galore just runs Cut Adapt. Um, uh, all of those are written by the same lab, and they uh, integrate uh, really well with one another. So we can actually call fast QC from Trim Galore. All right. So why is it useful to trim the libraries? If we have uh, those, like uh, we saw in our sequence, a uh, adapter sequences and some low quality. Uh, sequences, especially, you know, towards the end of our reads, um, that's going to reduce your mapping rate. Uh, but like I said earlier, you you don't want to be overly aggressive when you're trimming. Uh, we really just want to get rid of that adapter and the really low quality stuff. Um, you don't want to trim too much, or then uh, you may not be able to determine as well where the read originated from in the genome, uh, such that, uh, you know, if you have a short read that's that's say 30 base pairs, it may align to uh, multiple regions in the genome. Whereas uh, if it's 80 base pairs, even though some of those are maybe lower quality, uh, you're gonna be uh, have a lot more specificity as to where that, uh, that aligns. All right, so I'll clear that out and I'm gonna go back to our slides. All right, so um, now what we wanna do is run uh, Trim Galore. Uh, so we'll do a module purge. Uh, and then we'll look for versions of Trim Galore that we have installed on our system. So we'll do module spider trim underscore galore. All right, so we only have one version uh, installed here again, um, but this says that we need to load uh, this dependency here, GCC core 11.2.0. Uh, so we will do module load uh, GCC core 11.2.0, and then we can load uh, Trim Galore along with that. All right, now we can, uh, once that's loaded, I'll clear this again, uh, we can run our Trim Galore command. Uh, and uh, we do that by calling Trim underscore Galore, and then uh, two dashes, uh, and then we're telling it it's paired in data. Uh, we're telling it two dashes that we want to run fast QC after we do the trimming. Uh, and uh, then uh, we will uh, do uh, just give it our two uh, reads. So control one underscore r one dot fast dot gz and control one underscore r two dot fast dot gz. Let me copy this and I'll throw this in chat and then get it running. All right, so uh, this will take a little bit longer than just running fast QC, um, uh, but it won't take long. Again, we're using uh, really truncated uh, files. All right. Uh, and so again, now we can go 
uh, back to our files. I'm going to hit uh, refresh here. All right, and we have things like our trimming report, our, uh, let's see, we have our trimming reports. Uh, let's see what this looks like. Um, it just gives you the uh, a summary of the uh, run, uh, the total number of reads processed. We had a lot of reads with adapters, 38%. So um, that's one of those benefits of, of removing those. Uh, the total number of base pairs processed, uh, you can see we have a small amount that were quality trimmed, uh, and then our our total written uh, base pairs that, that passed all the filtering was about ninety two percent of what we fed in for uh, R one. If we look at or was that R two? I think that was R two. All right, and so you can see here uh, we still had a lot of adapters. Um, but we have slightly higher uh, total base pairs being written out, uh, again, because of that higher quality uh, that comes with the initial uh, section of the Illumina run. Uh, and then we can also, let's just, uh, our uh, corrected reads um, will have the underscore val and then that's validated. Um, and so the HTMLs that have the uh, val in them are what correspond to uh, our fast queue runs on the trimmed reads. So I'm gonna download this and open. Uh, so we ran into some errors now per base sequence content. Um, we have these uh, weird spikes at the end, which you may uh, uh, want to trim out. I find that it's it's best, uh, this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying um, avoid overly aggressive trimming practices, this type of thing, wanting to cut this off and keep cutting it back will actually start reducing, in my experience, your read mapping rate. Uh, there's really no reason uh, to worry about this, um, it's what's expected. Um, they're all gonna be slightly different links depending on how much was filtered out. Uh, but our overrepresented sequences, you can see now are gone. Um, that was the, the main issue. Uh, so uh, this is something that though um, you may wanna play around with. Uh, it's just in my experience, uh, the more you start to try to trim out these, these regions uh, based on base uh, sequence content, the lower again that your your overall mapping quality is going to be. Uh, so now we're going to move on to uh, aligning now our uh, trimmed reads to uh, reference genome. Uh, and there are really kind of two uh, major uh, splice aware aligners uh, that are out there right now: Star uh, and HiSat two. Uh, today, we're going to be using, I believe, HiSat 2. Um, I like HiSat 2 of the two CPU versions. Uh, uh, I like HiSat 2 a little more. It's a little less uh, memory hungry, especially when indexing the genome. Um, but they're both fantastic read aligners. Uh, so you really can't go wrong with, with either one, Star or HiSat 2. Uh, now, though, um, that NVIDIA has come out with a GPU accelerated version of uh, STAR, that's what I would tend to use. And again, we have our, uh, uh, we should be having our N NVIDIA Parabricks, um, which is a software that allows for this um, course this afternoon. Um, uh, and so that's going to take, you know, if your reads take 30 minutes to align, uh, with the CPU version of STAR, it may take, you know, five minutes, uh, four minutes or something like that with with uh, the GPU version. Um, the first thing that we need to do with, with either of these programs or any really uh, Illumina-based program uh, is to index the genome. Uh, it only needs to be done once. So, you know, if you have 10 samples in your study, 
uh, you only need to index the genome one time, and then you can use the that index to uh, during your read alignments of all ten samples. Uh, we do at the HPRC will maintain a set of index genomes um, for people uh, for these different software packages. The index is going to be specific for the different software package. So um, if you want to try both Star and HiSat2, you're going to have to index the genome using those programs. Um, uh, but if you want us at the HPRC to do it, we are happy to do so. And then we'll put that in a uh, a uh, shared space that everybody can access. We are not going to be using string tie after the alignment. No, not today. All right, so let's go back. I'll hit clear here. Uh, so we're not going to be doing any um, RNA-seq assembly today. Uh, what we're doing is just uh, counting on the uh, the genome annotation to do counts for uh, each each gene. So we're not looking at like transcript level differences. Um, which uh, you may need to use string tie to do uh, if that's what you're interested in. If there's like, uh, yeah, variations of your like splice variants, then uh, you may need to get, you know, a little finer grain than we're going to today. All right, so we're gonna do a module purge. And then again, we're gonna use a module spider to look for high sat. All right, and we can see we'll need to load these dependencies and then we can load high stat too. So I'll just copy those and then high stat too. All right, and then uh, once we have that loaded, uh, we can just run high stat two dash H to get all of the Let's do that again. All of the information on, on how to run this program. Uh, so you can see there's a lot here. Uh, we won't be using all of these options, but um, you know, if you get as you get more familiar with doing this and you know your own samples and things, uh, you may want to go in and uh, try to refine uh, these different uh, configurations using different presets, uh, trying uh, different uh, alignment protocol or algorithms and things like that. We're just going to be doing a, a pretty straightforward default alignment uh, and it works uh, really well for this, this sample. All right, so our uh, we have a, an index uh, genome uh, that I made for this course. It is in uh, a shared space, uh, scratch slash data slash bio. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm just going to make a new variable, and I'm going to call it IDX or indexed genome, and then I'm going to give it to the, the path to our indexed genome. So data, bio. All right. So we'll run this, and then we can use that whenever we run uh, is. Uh, the input whenever we run HiSat2. Uh, so uh, to run HiSat2 now, we have to do HiSat2. Uh, and then X is the, the index prefix that we used. Uh, so in this case, we're just going to call that variable that we just made, uh, which gives it the full path. And this way, not everybody has to generate the index file, uh, which can take quite a bit of time. Uh, then we'll do uh, dash P too. So we're just going to be using two threads. Um, and then uh, our first read, dash one, is control one underscore val one dot fq dot gz. Our reverse read nope. There we go, .fq.gz. And then finally, our uh, output file 
which we'll just call control1.sam. All right. Uh, so you can see um, it spits out all of these statistics, which is really nice, um, uh, exactly how things are aligning. Uh, we can see we have an overall alignment rate of 93.52, which is really good. The meaning of each parameter. Okay, so what we, um, this is, we've done a very, very simple uh, high sat two run. Uh, we've only included uh, the uh, index genome, that's the dash X. Uh, the dash P is the number of uh, threads that you wanna run. Uh, so with larger data sets, obviously this is not a real data set. This is just a portion of a real data set. You'd want to increase that to say something like 30, right? So that you're running all these jobs in parallel and that'll speed up your alignment process. Um, the dash one is just our forward, uh, forward reads. So the control one, uh, R1, the validated ones are trimmed. The dash two is the reverse reads. And then the dash S we're just, uh, throwing everything into a uh, SAM file, so that human readable alignment file. So if I do ls lh, all right, perfect. I'm, I'm glad it helped. Uh, we can see now that we've got um, our SAM file here uh, that's uh, fairly, well, one of the larger files that we have in there. Uh, and so it's it's not uncommon. These things can get, uh, you know, uh, tens of gigab uh, gigabytes in size, the SAM files. Uh, the BAM, once we convert it to a BAM, it's going to be a much smaller binary uh, format. All right. So uh, now uh, something, the next thing we need to do is uh, convert uh, and sort our uh, alignment file to that the binary format. And uh, you may need to, to do sorting, um, which you, you'll have to do for differential expression. And that's either uh, based on uh, the name of the, the read so that they're in like sequential order or the position to which they mapped in the genome. It's typically the latter. Uh, you may also need to do things like add read groups. Um, and you can do all these steps with, with SAM tools and Picard tools. Um, we're going to be using SAM tools today. So we'll do a module purge. Uh, and then we'll look for uh, SAM tools. All right, so now we've got a lot of different versions of uh, SAM tools installed on ASUS. Uh, so we'll need to run module spider again. We could have just copied this line here. Pasted module spider SAM tools uh, 1.17. So uh, we can see uh, we've got this dependency here. Um, so now we can load that. And then uh, we can load SAM tools. And so um, once you, you know, which modules you need to learn, uh, load. Um, that would be included in your job script that you submit. Um, so you would just put in a line that says module load this and then uh, whatever command that you want to run. Uh, and so we'll be running uh, a SAM tool sort command here. There's a lot of tools in SAM tools. Let me, let's see, is, is it just H? Nope. There we go. I'll just run SAM tools. You can see uh, it's there's a lot of different things you can do. Uh, we'll be doing um, uh, an index. Uh, FADEX is something that you may have to index. Uh, FADEX index your uh, genome if you want to look at it in a browser. Uh, you can add or replace uh, RG tags, uh, do merge um, uh, BAM files, uh, convert BAM files to faster or fast Q files get coverage, depth, like all sorts of stats of your alignment file, uh, or just view um, your files. Uh, we're gonna be running uh, SAM tools uh, sort uh, right here. 
to sort our alignment file. Sam tools sort, and I'm going to say threads uh, is equal to two. Our output, uh, we're going to call it control one sorted dot bam. And uh, we'll just give it our input file control one uh, dot Sam. Copy that, hit enter. All right. Uh, and again, this is a really small BAM file, so it takes about two seconds. And there's the command in chat. The next thing we need to do is uh, index our actual BAM file. So we'll just do SAM tools index, control one, sorted.bam. So that's the only uh, thing that you need to give it. So let me do uh, an ls here, and you can see now we've got our bam file, our sam file that we started off with. Uh, now we have our bam file, and then the index of that bam file, which is going to be required for a lot of the software to produce our read counts. So let me do this ls dot lh. Uh, and so you can see that we've got um, like this fourfold reduction in size going from uh, the SAM uh, to the BAM format. So it's a good way to save a lot of your space is, is to keep things in binary format rather than uh, in the SAM format. So there are a, a lot of packages available to, to generate read counts. Um, we're gonna be using HTSeq today. Uh, but there are also feature counts and a package that I really like um, that uh, is what I use um, if, it, if I'm doing uh, like a differential expression study. Uh, it's called genomic ranges. Um, and uh, essentially, at this point, we would just move into R uh, and generate the read counts there. Uh, but this process can take uh, quite a bit of time to do in R. Uh, and so it's not really uh, amenable to uh, working with a short course. So uh, we'll be doing HTSeq today um, and already have a bunch of counts generated using HTSeq. Um, but I do really do like that genomic ranges package. Uh, you just get to move right into like R straight after uh, sorting your BAM files. Uh, so it's really nice. Um, and it does a very good job of uh, generating read counts, I think. All right. so. Let's do a module purge here. And then um, we're going ahead and uh, we've already got all of the dependencies that we need uh, shown here. So we'll just load those. All right, and then uh, to run HTC count, we call HTC count. And then we're telling it, how is it sorted? It's sorted by position. What do we want to count? The reads per gene in the dash i. And then all we have to do is give it our BAM file, uh, our annotation file, which it's going to use to identify the coordinates it needs for, for counting. And then we're going to write everything out to control one underscore counts dot text. So this is going to be, I mean, uh, the number of uh, GFF lines getting processed. This isn't a a a cut down GFF. This is a full thing. So that's how long that would take. Um, but we only have uh, a short number of uh, pairs processed, uh, and then we have mate records missing for twenty four records. All right. So it looks like uh, a read that that failed to map. Um, one of its its paired partners, which twenty four out of two hundred thousand isn't so bad.
All right, and so now let's see, LS, um, what did I call it? Control. Uh, let's just look at it more, Control one. Uh, and so now you can see it's gonna be this really long file with just the G names and the number of reads that aligned in each of those genes. It's, there we go, now we're getting to real genes. Uh, so obviously we very reduced library. So these read counts are really low, but luckily um, I generated full read counts in the counts directory. So LS counts. Uh, so we can go in, um, each of those count files looks the same as, um, the sample table, um, we'll do a cat counts sample table. And so all this is, is a comma separated file. It's got the sample name, uh, the file name and, uh, the condition. So we have our, uh, five controls here, um, their names, where those counts are located. And then our, uh, experimental group, which is that NAD supplement, or it's a uh, B3 supplement. Um, and, and we're gonna look at uh, eye tissue and see how those two groups differ. And you'll see why I really like this data set. All right, so we're gonna be using DEC2 uh, today. Uh, there are a few different packages that people use for differential expression. Uh, DEC2, DEC I think, is uh, uh, one of the, the better ones. It's There's a lot of documentation on how to use it. Uh, this link here will give you a whole vignette on uh, different things that you can do. We'll be covering just some basic stuff. Uh, and then, um, But there's all sorts of, of different variations on things that you can do. So... Um, we're going to be running today, though, on, here, let me do this. Uh, go back to our HPRC portal. Uh, and then we'll click on interactive apps. And we'll go to our studio. All right, and uh, this will bring up the page to change all of your options here. Um, we uh, only have this uh, this version of R available right now, which is uh, one of the newer, if not the newest. Um, you can set your number of hours, um, just one or two is fine. Uh, the number of uh, cores or CPUs, one is plenty. Uh, and then uh, the amount of memory, uh, 12 gigabytes uh, should be good. Um, we don't need to put this information in. We'll just uh, click launch. And uh, now the job is in the queue and uh, it should pop up pretty soon. All right, so the first command you wanna do is to uh, Go ahead and just set, uh, you're gonna wanna open a new file in uh, R Studio. So this should look very similar. I'm starting R Studio to what you get. Uh, let me close out the stuff I was writing. Uh, up here in the left-hand side, there's gonna be a little plus. Uh, R script right there. In this, in this section up here, uh, you'll need to uh, run this command here, set WD. That's gonna set your working directory um, and then set it to uh, this full path here uh, and replace uh, username with your uh, uh, actual username, which will be a uh, u dot uh, your initials and then some number like shown up here in the, the right. It's going to be okay. 
Uh, it'll be also, if you run RStudio, you can open up here. I'm just going to, all right. So if you're in RStudio, uh, you can do uh, terminal. Uh, and I'm just going to open up a, a terminal um, and you can type in who am I and uh, that'll bring up your username and then you can do up here set WD uh, slash scratch user and then I would put in uh, here I put in W Brashear uh, but whatever is the output of that so uh, uh, u.com wb some number or whatever your your id is and then slash rna underscore class uh slash counts so i'm going to set it on my side um which is going to be a little bit different from y'all since this is my local machine All right, so I've set it to the counts directory that I downloaded. Um, and then now in the console, I'm just doing list.files. Yeah, so in the terminal, um, if, well, uh, PWD in the terminal gives you your, your current working directory. Um, and that's a, a Linux or Unix command. Uh, the same command in, uh, if you're in the console in R is get WD or get your working directory and then open and close parentheses. And so uh, that's the difference. So here we did, uh, I did a list files, open, close parentheses. And I can see that I've got all of these counts files that I'm interested in. And uh, in terminal, that command would have just been uh, oops, ls, uh, but you can see here in the, the terminal, I'm in uh, a different place. So I could cd documents uh, counts, and then uh, that'll bring all of this up. But in console, it is list.files. All right, next. We need to load uh, the libraries that we are uh, interested in uh, working with, or the packages. And we do that with a library command. And all of these uh, are already installed on uh, ASUS. Uh, we're going to load uh, ggplot2, which is a visualization package, uh, p heatmap, which allows us to draw heat maps. Uh, obviously, we want DEseq2. And then finally, uh, Enhanced Volcano. And then I'm just going to select all of this here and hit Run. Cool. Um, it looks like I don't have pHeatMap installed on my system. So I'm going to do that real quick. Oh my word, I don't have anything installed on my system. Has everybody been able to load the packages on uh, ASUS? Uh, What's, they should all be there. All right, uh, which uh, other packages are saying? By how generic, S4 vectors. Um, those should all be loaded already. 
I'm not sure why that's not working. Said so you can uh, check mark every package you want in the right. So uh, we can see uh, now everything that's check marked is what's loaded. Um, P heat maps loaded now. ggplot2. Uh, where is DESeq? I may have to restart our studio for it to show up over here. Um, but we should be good to go. Uh, once we have done that, the first thing we want to do is read in our sample table. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Can it, is that good? a good side for everybody? All right. Uh, so uh, we're going to use the read.csv function to just read in our uh, sample table.csv. And we're going to tell it it has a header. And we can run this line. Uh, and then we're going to convert this into a data frame to work with. And we'll just use the as data frame function and sample table. And then uh, we'll need to uh, convert one of these. Uh, let's just look at this real quick. All right, so we have our sample table here. We're going to convert the condition into um, a data type called factors. Uh, which is required by BEC2. And it's what it's how it uh, tells the difference between these groups. So uh, the factor uh, will uh, split these into essentially two different groups. So sample uh, table, dollar sign condition. So now we're just changing this one column of the data frame to a factor. And we're feeding in uh, the same column that we're changing. So sample table, dollar score condition, uh, factor, sample table, uh, dollar score condition. And so now if I run uh, if I run summary, I think uh, let's try that. Uh, we can see um, now there's, there's in this condition, there's five in the control and five in the experimental group. All right, has everybody been able to load and uh, convert your sample table? All right, excellent. All right, so uh, the next command, let's do this. Uh, we're going to create our uh, DEseq object. We'll call it DDS. And this is one of my favorite commands uh, I've ever run across. It's DEseq dataset from HTC count. It's very specific uh, to everything we've done up to this point, which is wonderful. Um, so we're creating this, this uh, DEseq format from data that we generated with this HTC count program. And we're gonna say our sample table is equal to sample table, because that's what we've been naming it. Uh, it's inside of uh, this directory. So um, we'll just put a period, which means the current directory. And then uh, finally, our design is going to be uh, the tilde by uh, condition. So let me do this. There we go. And then if we run DDS now to look at it, you can see it is a DEseq data set. These are the dimensions. So there's 46,000 genes uh, across 10 samples. Uh, then a lot of metadata, 
what type of assay it is. This is just count data. The row names are going to be your gene names. Uh, the column names are uh, our sample names, so control one through NAD5. And then we have uh, our condition. The next step is we want to uh, filter out uh, genes with, with low read counts. Um, this isn't necessary in as, as much as the for, it's not necessary for the calculation of DE genes. It doesn't have a major effect. It does have, it, it can have an effect, but uh, it's more so for the speed, uh, which we're going through here. Oh. Let me, yeah, copy and paste. I apologize, I should have been doing that. All right, so uh, we're gonna do a keep and some little bit of lead work, leg work here. We're gonna use the row sums uh, and then get the counts from DDS. And uh, row sums is just gonna sum up the reads uh, from each sample. Um, and then we're gonna do a uh, selection here and just pick everything that's got at least 10 read counts across all samples. So if we run this, um, and then um, we can apply that to our DDS by calling our DDS and uh, saying we want to use everything that was true here. So if we do duty S again, we can see we've cut down the, the number of genes in half, right? So we lost a lot of those genes that uh, had really low recounts. So we don't need to consider those whenever we're doing our downstream analyses. All right, so now we're actually to the point where we can just run our differential expression analysis. So that's exciting. And uh, we're just going to replace our TDS with DEC uh, or the output of the DEC function. And all we have to give it is our uh, DEC uh, data object, data set. Why are you unable to find? Oh my word, okay. Getting scared there for no reason. All right, so um, it's get, it, it's gone through and uh, done all of the different steps for this differential expression analysis, the model fitting, the dispersion estimates, all of that. Um, and so now to get the results, uh, we can, um, here, let's do this in the actual script itself. That way you, um, you can maintain a copy of it. Oh, I'm having all sorts of issues, technical issues. All right, results, um, we'll call it res, and we're just going to call the results function on DDS. So another super easy uh, command. And then if we run res here, uh, it's going to show all of our, uh, the, uh, the essentially the, the statistics for our differential expression. So let me throw this into the chat. I'm gonna pull this up here. And we'll just we'll just go through this. So this is the output you should see from running the RES, uh, that variable that's holding all the results from our uh, DE seq output. Um, and uh, let's go through. 
So this is just the uh, normalized uh, mean counts for all samples for each gene. It's the row. Uh, the log uh, two-fold change. So this is going to be up here. You can see it's the NAD supplement versus the control. Uh, the log fold change standard error. Uh, this is the wald statistic uh, for the NAD supplement versus control. And uh, finally, our p-value. Uh, this is unadjusted, though. Um, so uh, we have to adjust for doing multiple tests. So essentially, we're calculating this for each gene um, across the entire genome or the, what's ever in our data set. Uh, so uh, we have to account for that. Uh, and so this is really the, the thing that you're going to look at to get your genes that are differentially expressed. So really your p-adjusted and your log two-fold change are going to be the ones that you're, you're most interested in. Are there any questions so far? All right, so if we want to get a summary of how many genes are actually uh, differentially expressed, we can look at that p-adjusted value and give it our standard cutoff of 0 0.05. And then we'll tell it to uh, remove all the uh, NAs and we'll run this. So this is showing that we have uh, 5,453 genes that match uh, that have p-values below 0 0.05. All right, did we ever run the test NAD files or only the control files in the first part of the class? Okay, so in the first part of the class, we were only using one of the control samples to go through the mapping process and accounts and generating account files. You would have to do that for each sample. I'm sorry if that was unclear. So we just did it for a small section of one of the control samples. Okay. All right, so uh, now obviously you'll want to be interested in getting all of these genes and uh, maybe in a nice spreadsheet that you can give to your boss. Um, so we'll do uh, this command to collect all of the uh, uh, genes that are uh, significantly differentially expressed. So less than 0 0.5, and 0.05. And then we'll run that. Let me throw this, this is a little bit, the syntax on this is a little odd. So I'm gonna throw that in chat. Uh, and so if we type in now SIG genes, our significant genes, and run that, we can see uh, now the data frame with those 5,453 5, genes and our statistics across the six columns. Uh, so we can just use the write.csv function and uh, write out our SIG genes data frame, and we'll call it differentially expressed. CSV, and we say road.names equals true. All right, and so now if I go to my documents, um, and I open up wherever it happened, uh, I've got this nice, uh, uh, spreadsheet of all of the differentially expressed genes that uh, we can go through and, and, and sort through uh, for uh, you know whatever we're interested in. All right, let me throw that in. And you should be able to go into the file browser in ACES and do the same thing.
All right. So and that's that's a a huge step. All right. Like we're we've got this real nice spreadsheet now. Like we know all of our differentially expressed genes. We've got the uh the direction of expression, you know, like these are far more expressed in in the controls, you know, or these are far more expressed in our NAD supplemented samples. Uh so uh but it's a, it's a Okay, um, let's see. If you go to uh, files uh, in your space, um, RNA class, oop, not there, uh, go into counts. It will be in here, it'll be called differentially expressed. It should be in here. And then you can view it in here. I don't have it, because I obviously I'm not working on ACES for some reason, but... Um, were you able to find it, Sophia? Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So that's exciting, right? I mean, we've got our differentially expressed genes in a file that we can just email our PI um, and say, there you go. I'm taking a break for Halloween. Um, but they may come back and say, hey, you didn't visualize any of these results. So let's do that. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is a PCA plot. Uh, and uh, what we want to do is log transform uh, the results and calculate uh, the row variance for the PCA. So we'll do, we'll just call these the log transformed. And we'll just use the R log uh, on DDS. which can take a couple seconds. Sometimes it complains about it. Uh, and then we'll get our row variance, we'll call that RV. All right, and so that's in chat. And then um, now we want to create a list of genes that we want to include in uh, that PCA plot. Uh, and so this is something that you'll want to play around with on your own data set for sure. Uh, we're going to reorder everything based on uh, getting the genes with the greatest amount of variance. So we're going to throw in that RV uh, data set that we just did. We say decreasing equals true. So starting off with the, those rows, those genes with the most variance. And then um, right here is where you may play around with your uh, own data set as to how many genes to include. Here we're only going to do um, 100. All right. So now if we do select here, All right, we've got our uh, 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 essentially our uh, top 100 um, genes with the most variance. So, uh, now that we have that, we can actually run our PCA. And we'll use the uh, PR comp function. And then we have to do some things. We have to transform or transpose our data. And then um, from the assay of log tran, so those log transformed uh, uh, results from the DDS that we created. And then from that, we are going to pull only those genes that we have uh, in the selected. So these are just going to be essentially row numbers. And then um, things in parentheses, uh, scale, we'll set the scale equal to, we'll do false in a scale.
All right, so that transpose is just going to uh, flip the, the rows and columns. Um, we're pulling those log transformed values. Uh, we're only, we're subsetting that entire DDS with um, the row numbers that we got from running select uh, the order function on uh, the uh, row variances and then setting the scale to false. And then um, we can just do summary now, PCA. And uh, that's going to spit out uh, our uh, components. And we can see the amount of variance that each component explains. And you may be able to spot why I love this data set so much. All right. so. Uh, the cumulative portion of variance explained here is by the first principal component is already uh, over 90%, which uh, I, I've never run across another uh, data set where the first principal component gets this high. Um, if you know, you're getting uh, 40, 50, 60, like that's, that's great. Um, so uh, this is a, a really nice uh, clean data set that makes a good example data set. All right, so uh, now we want to set up the PCA to run uh, ggplot2. Uh, and so this takes a little bit of, we're going to, I'm going to show you some formatting to make things look nice. Um, we really uh, could get away with doing this a little bit simpler. Um, but the first thing we're going to do is uh, essentially take um, the standard deviation um, from our PCA, and uh, uh, we can square that and uh, multiply it, and that'll give us our essentially our percent variance that we want explained in a nice number format. And so that's all we're doing here is uh, really just cleaning up numbers. So uh, run, and then if we do uh, percent there, see now we've got 90.8% of the uh, variance explained. It's so like you don't really necessarily need to do this step. It just makes it look a lot cleaner. Let me put that in the chat. Um, and then uh, we can start doing our, uh, making our ggplot. So uh, first thing we got to create the, the data for it, ggpca underscore out. And we're going to do as dot data dot frame. And then we're going to pull from uh, the PCA. This whole table. Uh, and then what we want to do is combine this data frame that we just created with our sample table data frame uh, so that we can go in and, and plot by sample name and things like that in condition. So uh, ggpca underscore out. And then we do a C bind, right, to bind the columns from the ggpca out with our sample table. Uh, so now if we want to take a look at this, we can do ggpca out. Uh, and we can see now that we've got uh, the component loadings uh, for each of the samples um, for each of the principal components. And now we should be good to go. All right, has anybody worked with uh, ggplot before? Uh, yes or no? All right. No? Oh, okay. All right, well, young key, Sophia, I'm sorry about, about what's what's about to happen. ggplot <laughs> and Jenny, okay. Uh, ggplot's really powerful and uh, uh, 
really a standard in da data visualization, especially in like the life sciences, right? So um, how it works is it, it creates these nice plots, but it does it in layers. Uh, so it's a little confusing. Uh, oh, R, first time in R. Oh my, all right. Uh, so uh, we have to, essentially this command is gonna, uh, we're setting up here first, we're calling our ggplot function. Uh, and then we have the first thing we feed it in is uh, the data set that we want it to plot. Uh, then we have to define what are called the aesthetics. Uh, and that's going to be uh, our X values, um, which are going to be PC1. Now it knows uh, that it's pulling PC1 from uh, GGPCA out. Uh, our Y, we'll just use PC2. And uh, we're going to be uh, using the color of the plots. Uh, and those are going to be colored by the condition. So again, that, that condition that was in the sample table. All right, so that's one layer. Um, that's like the head thing, general, like that's um, essentially initializing the GG plot. So let's add in a plus symbol. And then we can go and uh, we'll use the geom point function. And that will give us, uh, that will actually lay down the points on our plot. And we'll say size equals four. Of course, you can change that however you want. That's gonna be one layer. Then we have to add in our uh, labels, uh, with the labs function. And uh, here we're gonna say X is equal to, and then we're gonna paste together some. Uh, so this paste zero function is just gonna take this string right here uh, and combine it with uh, this uh, right here, that we're in that variable where we made those numbers look nice for the amount of variation that each, each principal component explained. It's just grabbing the first one, which was that 90.8, and then uh, combining it with this. Uh, and then next, we'll do that same thing for the Y. Uh, all right, but this time, again, PC2 now, and then we're grabbing the second one. And uh, after that, we're gonna add in a final layer, which is a theme, uh, which just gives us a nice uh, background. And there are all sorts of different themes. So hopefully I'll run this in my ggplots, not corrupt. It is corrupt. All right. Um, uh, you should get this nice looking plot like this, right? Uh, there's all sorts of, there's no end to uh, the customizations you can do with uh, PCA or with ggplot. Um, and we get a lot of variance explained um, between the 90, uh, but on the first uh, principal component where most of that variance is caught. And so you can see this massive separation between the control and those receiving the uh, NAD supplement. We are rapidly running out of time. Let's see if I can... Uh, there's a, the command um, to run Enhanced Volcano is, uh, I'm going to throw that in chat, and I'm going to try it, and hopefully that package is working for me. Uh, no, I'm having the same issue. Uh, but that should work for you. Let's just go over this real quick. Uh, we're gonna use our the results here. Uh, we give it the uh, data for labels, which is gonna be the row names. Uh, our X axis, our Y axis, and then where we want our P cutoff to be and our FC cutoff, um, the values for that, and then uh, different uh, graphing parameters. And so you should end up with a plot that looks like this, right? So where we've got the, the greatest log fold change 
and things like uh, KCNA4, and these are going to be labeled. Uh, and uh, these dotted lines are uh, what we the values that we put in here, so you can adjust your uh, fold change cutoff and move those lines and so forth. Um, I'll just go over this briefly since we're out of time. Our uh, To do a heat map, uh, what we want to do is reorder the results based on the adjusted p-values and then assign genes with adjusted p-values um, below a certain threshold. Here we're saying 0.05 and uh, we're gonna grab the ones that have the greatest log two fold change uh, and throw those into this variable SIG. So essentially we're just sorting through and grabbing the ones that have the greatest absolute value change in log uh, or log fold change um, that have uh, a adjusted P value of at least 0.05. Uh, and then, um, We'll uh, get the row names uh, for what we've uh, selected to run the heat map. And that should pull out all of the ones that are showing that really great amount of log fold change. Uh, then you'll want to trans uh, normalize the data. I'm sorry, I'm throwing all of this at you so fast. We're technically a minute over. And uh, then to plot it, finally, we can run that command. And that's going to produce this nice uh, heat map uh, based on recounts where we can see we've clustered uh, based on the actual input from the, the data that we gave it. And you can see we've got these, these nice trees that are in all of these are clustering correctly. All of the controls have clustered together in this branch and all of the uh, experimental group have clustered together in this branch. We can see massive changes in gene expression uh, with really upregulated DC and LYZ2 and CYBB in the controls uh, versus all of these upregulated upreg genes in the example data or the uh, experimental data. Uh, so um, with that, thank you very much for your patience today. I really appreciate it. Uh, we had a lot of technical issues, but I think um, we, we got through quite a bit. So I appreciate everybody being patient. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to uh, email or reach out. 